So good morning, everybody. I am pleased to welcome you to our webinar, Nature Friendly Gardening for Beginners with the Master Gardeners. My name is Kim Pleger, and I am an educator with Kitsap County Stormwater Division, and I'm really happy to be here as your host today. So before I begin, I'd like to um, start with a land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is within the Aboriginal territory of the people of clear saltwater Suquamish people. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish people live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish people live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. The West Sound Stormwater Outreach Group and Master Gardeners acknowledge that we gather on indigenous land, the traditional territory of Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Suquamish tribe. So today's event is brought to you by the Kitsap County Master Gardeners and by the West Sound Stormwater Outreach Group. So this group includes the jurisdictions you see on the screen now, Bainbridge Island, Bremerton, Pig Harbor, Kitsap County, Port Angeles, Port Orchard, and Polesbow. And we all work collaboratively on education projects around water quality. So more specifically, our goal is to reduce pollutants such as metals from cars, pet waste or chemicals from yards that run off into our streets, enter storm drains and eventually local creeks, streams and Puget Sound. We hope that by the end of today's webinar, you will learn a few new tips so that you can not only have a beautiful yard but also use healthier methods that will protect your family, pets and Puget Sound. So before we begin the webinar, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping notes and help orient you to the features in Zoom. So we'll hear our presentation for the next 30 minutes or so. And then we have also reserved plenty of time at the end of the session to answer your questions. Um, the session is being recorded. And after the event, I'll be sending out an email with a link so that you can go back and watch it later. During today's session, you're muted and you're not on camera, um, so participants cannot see or hear you during this time. Uh, the chat button at the very bottom is just so that you can email um, or chat with one of the hosts or panelists if you have a technical issue. So if you have questions, what we'd like you to do is use the Q&A button and you can type your questions into the um, Q&A section at any time during the presentation. And then um, other folks who are reviewing and seeing those questions, you can um, do the little thumbs up if you also have the same question and wanna upvote that. Um, so we have staff at the very end who's sort of monitoring those questions and we will try to answer as many um, of the questions as we can um, during the allotted time period. Um, and then we'll also give you a way to contact Master Gardeners directly afterwards if you think of other questions um, after we end our webinar. So I am now pleased to introduce Robin Small. Robin has been a Kitsap County Master Gardener since 2008, and I'm really excited to have her here today. So thank you, Robin, it's all yours. And you're muted, do you want me to unmute you? There, there we go. go. Good okay. morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Robin Small, and I've been a master gardener with w WSU Extension Office since 2008. I've been a gardener for most of my life, and I've worked in many different jobs in the horticultural industry for 25 years, over 25 years. I was originally trained as an ornamental gardener in the UK, but have since embraced all forms of gardening including food production and community building as a master gardener. I was a coordinator for the Blueberry Park Pea Patch from 2009 to 2013, and also one of the lead gardeners for the demonstration garden, <clears throat> excuse me, in the park. Today, I'll spend some time telling you successful ways to encourage wildlife to share your yard 
while making your garden an earth-friendly oasis. It does not want to go. Okay, try to hover back under the bottom and sometimes you'll see the, uh, at the very bottom of- Oh, I see it, yep. Yeah. Okay, I guess it's on screen instead of on my computer. There we go. Got it, okay. So this is a sign that many of you may have seen somewhere on the internet. Um, it does a great job of concisely stating the aims of organic sustainable gardening. So it says, if something is not eating your plants then your garden is not part of the ecosystem. And the goal is always to have a balance in all, balance in all aspects of your garden. That means you might have to have a tolerance between weeds and plants. Weeds, after all, are only plants that are in the wrong place. Have beneficial insects on your in your garden, there needs to be a sufficient food source of prey. Oh, am I cutting in? Um, closing the garden waste stream by comp composting means that worms and insects need to eat your trash. Sustainable gardens are anything but sterile and separate from their environment. Sharing the garden with wildlife is a very large topic, and I could spend an hour on each point on this presentation. And, but instead today, I'm going to give you a brief taster to hopefully get you interested and motivated to do further research on how sustainable gardening could fit into your gardening journey. Okay, wildlife in the garden can be anything from the smallest bacteria in your soil to a bear. The next few slides are all of animals and insects that I've found just in my own yard. I live in the city limits of Bremerton in a neighborhood with neighbors on all four sides of me. Um, my property is not larger than about half acre, um, but that's also including our house and my mother has a house that's built on the same property. So our yard's not very large. Um, it doesn't matter how big or small a garden you have. What matters is using methods that don't require the use of man-made chemicals and are safer for animals, humans, and the environment. This first slide is a beneficial pollinators. Pollinators are not just bees, although sustainable gardening is an imperative to keep native bee and honeybee populations from disappearing. Moths, butterflies, wasps, and some flies all help to pollinate not only food crops for humans, but native plant species that produce seeds, nuts, and berries for birds and other animals. Predatory insects, they prey on insects that we see as, as pests, sap-sucking aphids, mosquitoes, and gnats. Lady beetles are the best, are the best um, predatory insects. Their larvae look like small orange and black alligators. There's a picture right in the middle of the screen really very tiny on top of that it's on a rose leaf. Um, their larva, they actually eat more aphids at, at that stage than at the adult stage. So they're very hungry little, little insects. Providing enough food so that they will lay eggs for the future generation really does mean putting up with a bit of damage from the prey insects. If there is no prey, there will be no predators, so. Spiders are beneficial in the garden too. They also eat annoying insects. Um, some make webs, which such as a common house spider or orb spinners, which in the upper left-hand corner is a house spider, giant house spider, and the orb spinner is on the right-hand side. Um, that is one of the, the, the orb spinner is the one that makes the giant webs that are all over your garden in the late summer that you have a tendency to get stuck in yourself. Some spiders like the crab spider, which is the white spider in the lower left-hand corner, lie in wait to attack their prey one at a time. So they actually, instead of catching a bunch of insects in their webs, they just get their prey one at a time as they need them. A lovely sight late in May is when the orb spinner eggs hatch all at once and all of the little babies disperse over the course of about a 24 hour period. But that's what the picture in the middle is, is of, of orb spinner babies that have hatched in the daytime and they're getting ready to fly away on their journey. 
So decomposers are a category of wildlife that you might not think much about, but without them, there would be nothing to efficiently break down dead plant material. Rain and weather are very ineffective and slow decomposers. Anything from slugs, native and imported snails, millipedes, roly polies, uh, earthworms, red wiggler, compost worms, beetles, even the bacteria and fungi in the soil help to break down materials. So it's a little bit of everything that you can find in your, if you have a compost bin, a compost pile, you'll fin find a little bit of these everywhere. Um, roly polies down in the lower bottom right hand middle. They're called pill bugs sometimes or sow bugs or potato bugs. They do a great job of decomposing. So amphibians and snakes, uh, western tree frogs, salamanders, and garter snakes all eat everything from annoying insects to slugs and very small, very, very small rodents, usually baby rodents. Uh, the garter snake is one of my favorite garden pals. They eat slugs and make themselves at home around my compost bin, but the red wigglers are toxic to, to them, so they don't bother them at all. Um, although they will eat most anything that they can overpower. So small mice and other rodent babies are sometimes on their menu. The tree frogs are great for, you know, eating mosquitoes and gnats and things like that too. And they also have just a great little or very loud song that they like to do. So the next category of wildlife would be birds, birds and songbirds, flickers, pheasants, great horned, horned owl, barred owls, sap suckers have all made appearances in my garden. Uh, the great horned owl was only once and it was gigantic. It was on the corner of my deck and I couldn't believe how big they are in person. Um, the barred owl is great if you need a 3 a.m. 3 a.m. alarm clock, the one that lives on our street. It gets very loud about that time. Hummingbirds are a daily sight, even in the winter, since in our area um, is home to non-migrating Anna's hummingbirds. So we tend to have them all year round, especially if you give them the right kind of plants to help feed them. Small mammals, they're a combination of welcome and not so welcome animals, gray squirrels, Douglas squirrels, which is the native squirrel to our region. Bats are very beneficial in controlling insect pests. Moles control gr grubs and other insects that people would otherwise use chemical pesticides to control. So like the, the grubs that um, in your grass that for crane fly larvae, larva, excuse me, um, the moles really, really like them a lot. And that's why you'll start seeing a lot of activity about this time of year for moles um, if you have a lot of larva in your grass. The next three slides are of animals that most people would like to exclude from the gardens completely. I could do a whole presentation weighing the pros and cons of each one. The main reason that all three of these animals have seemed to increase in population in the recent years though, is that we humans are forcing them to have smaller and smaller ranges of habitat by clear cutting forests at areas near, it, near us and claiming former farm and grasslands for housing developments. We have forced these animals to have nowhere to go except our yards. The only North American marsupial possum actually helps to control fleas and ticks in your yard. They eat them incessantly and they eat them off themselves. They eat them off of the yard, uh, the ground and around the trees or around your plants and things. Raccoons, they like trash and I can assure you coat that. Feeding dogs and cats outside can be like a beacon for the raccoons. Make sure to remove pet food as soon as feeding is finished. Keeping all trash cans either in a closed garage, which is preferred, or tightly closed outside if you're not able to do that, goes a long way to keep these guys uninterested in your yard and just keeping, you know, tidy, tidy up your space as much as you can. Um, sometimes just a, like a bungee cord put across the top of your guard, your trash can is enough to keep them out. Um, I have trash cans outside. I only have a carport. I don't have an enclosed garage and my trash cans, as long as I keep the lid firmly on the top, they don't seem to bother them at all. Deer, whole books have been written on these guys. I have tried to just tolerate a certain amount of deer browsing. I really, these pictures are from my backyard 
just last summer and the one deer in the upper left hand corner is huge he, I don't know how much in my yard he actually eats but it's quite a bit um I've also opted to protect protect plants on a rotating basis so that means I, I have, have a lot of uh, movable screens and fencing and I use a lot of bird medi bird netting thrown over um, plants and things to protect as there is like maybe some of my beans are starting to come in to flower which they really like the flowers a lot I'll put bird mesh over them until they're done flowering until the beans start to, to form um, I have a fence on all three sides of my yard but there's no way that I could completely fence in my lot it just wouldn't work so I have I'm not able to use permanent fencing. So I just have to kind of deal with it as it comes, as the damage comes up. So here's some ways that I deal with a deer browsing issue. I have movable covers. The picture in the left-hand corner is a, a, a walled bed that has strawberries in it. And I also have um, these mesh covers that, have, that lean up against them and will protect them quite well from the Deer, the deer really, really, really like strawberry plants a lot. And so if I don't cover them up, they'll disappear. I won't even have any plants at all. Um, the hoops on all of my raised beds um, are, are a, I'm able to put reme or bird netting quickly over a bed that's maybe has lettuce or something in it that's starting to get browsed. I'll cover it up as soon as I start to see damage. And that's just, it's, enough deterrent to keep the deer away, make them move on to something else. Um, they usually eat about three to four feet up because they're really lazy. They don't like to stretch much if they don't have to. So the picture on the right-hand side shows the damage on my bean, my bean vines. They usually eat it right through the middle every time. So everything that's up above, I don't have to worry about. Um, I'll have a harvest of above, but I'll lose everything down below. So sometimes I'll cover it with reme, sometimes I will just leave, let it be. It's kind of what I feel like in the day, I guess. Okay, so there are four things that you need to do encourage wildlife to visit and feel at home in your garden. Garden sustainably, gardening sustainably using organic methods, providing food, water, and shelter. These pictures do a great job of showing a wildlife friendly and unfriendly yard. The one on the left is nicely mowed and tidy looking but there's absolutely nothing to entice the wildlife, not even a spot to stop and hide or rest that isn't out in the open. The much smaller garden area on the right actually includes all the criteria required. It is organically managed, not using excess fertilizers or pesticides. There is a lot of space for birds and other animals to take a break from sun or predators and have a little bit of shelter. There will be food from some of the plants in the winter in the form of seeds and rose hips, and it's not the, the roses aren't visible yet. Um, you can just barely make out the roses actually in the left hand part of this picture. But though, so that'll be hips all went off late summer and into the winter. Um, there'll, and there's also a small water source that's tucked in behind the ginkgo tree. It's not very easy to see. It's actually down below. Um, and it's a lot more pleasing to look at than the open lot is, honestly. So the first ingredient in gardening using organic methods. Um, it's much, much easier task than you might think. Organic methods res respect the integrity of life all around us from the living elements of the soil in which the plants are grown to the, equali the quality of the air we breathe, not using gas powered tools that pollute the air and cause excess noise pollution. You might say, yeah, okay, that's great. But what happens if I have a pest or disease that is attacking my plants? How do I deal with that in a sustainable way I and mean, get rid of that? The answer is the concept of integrated pest management or IPM for short. There's a way to think through problems. This is the way to th think through problems in the garden using the least invasive means necessary. Looking at the chart, starting at the top, I'll go through the different steps um, involved in using IPM. So at the top, you want to inspect your plants on a fairly regular basis. So that means um, checking, daily checking a plant health. If pests caused, if a pest causes damage to accurately identify the pest or the disease, so you'd want to get it identified and make sure you identify it correctly. Uh, not 
identifying a pest correctly um, can mean that you damage your plants by trying to get rid of the, in, the pest or disease and the disease is still there. Uh, Master Gardeners are a really great source for the information for this. There's a web link at the end that will help you find the local Master Gardener plant clinics so you can bring in samples of the damage or plants to have ID'd. Um, and we're also starting to be back at the farmer's markets on a regular basis now in person, which is a great thing. So pretty much all the fat farmer's markets have master gardeners on hand um, on their day. So um, the next thing after you identify the pest or disease is to monitor it. You want to keep an eye on how or if the damage continues. Spittle bugs are a great example of a situation that corrects itself without having to do any intervention. The cocoons of spittle go away once the insect hatches and spittle bugs just seem to disappear. They're not seen again until the following spring. They don't really cause any damage. They're just using the branches of the, of the plant. Usually it's like lavenders and rosemaries, especially they like um, just to, to build their cocoons for the young. Um, action may be needed after you've monitored for a while and decide you need to take some action. Maybe there's no beneficial um, predators coming to take care of your aphids. Um, it could be as simple as cutting off the branch that is affected or spraying aphid in, an aphid infestation with a strong stream of water from your hose. If you do that for a few days in a row, that usually tends to really drown them out and take care of them. So evaluation is the next step. And that means that if you decide that you decide if the action has accomplished its goal or not, if not, then maybe another action is needed to perform with a more powerful solution. So at the basis, IPM relies on constant observation to catch problems early when they may be easily, where catch them early where they be, may be more easily taken care of than letting the problem get too large. So the next slide is, uh, it's called the plant disease triangle. So in order for pests or diseases to um, infect a plant, there, all, all these parts need to happen at the same time. If you take any of these parts out, then chances are really good that the disease is not gonna happen. The pest isn't gonna arrive. Um, the, the plant disease triangle is every disease or pest needs to have just the right conditions to occur. The host plant needs to be susceptible, susceptible to the disease. The environment has to have just the right weather conditions for disease to thrive. And the pest or disease needs to be in the area. If you take one thing out of that diagram, magically, no disease or pest infestation happens. The one phrase and belief that we as master gardeners live by and preach is right place, right, right plant, right place. That means that you always consider all of the requirements a plant has and make sure that where you want to plant ticks all of the boxes. Healthy thriving plants make use using organic methods much easier. So. So this is the IPM um, pyramid, which shows you all the steps in a little bit easier to um, visualize way for some. Um, so down at the bottom, it's the prevention. Prevention is your is by far the biggest step. That that's that's usually all that you need to do to to prevent pests or diseases to have from happening. Um, Prevention at the bottom is the most basic part. Um, the nuclear option of using chemicals at the very, very top, even chemicals that are made from plants organically like pyrethrum should only be considered as a last resort. And honestly, it's more likely that the infected plant gets taken out completely during the physical stage um, of prevention than getting sprayed with chem chemicals. So I've, I've had shrubs and trees that especially as rhododendrons are a really good example. Um, it, they maybe have some kind of fungal disease or something that's not quite right. And then they get sicker and sicker and more weak. Eventually, you know, and you cut off more branches that are affected. Eventually you're at a point where you just have to decide, is it easier to just take the tree out, take the shrub out or take the perennial out and replace it with something else that's better suited for the site um, instead of going all the way to spraying it with chemicals. Okay, you might be wondering how to know if a bag soil or fertilizer is organic. 
the answer is that it is stamped on the outside. And this this um, stamp is it looks just like it, this slide right here. Um, it's called um, OMRI. It's OMRI listed. So OMRI stands for Organic Materials Research Institute. Uh, this organization puts out an updated list every year with the products that pass standards to be used in organic farming. The list is available to the public and handy to see what products are actually available. So you can go online to OMR, omri.org and actually download the PDF or just look at it and look through and, and, and find out if, if any of the, the products that you're using are listed with OMRI, then that's a pretty good bet that it's a good relatively safe product. Um, they still do have, you know, organic uh, chemicals that are listed because they're, they're used, used in organic, organic farming and some of the things might not be um, available for home gardeners. But if you, you know, see, see something at the big box store, you can look it up on Omri and, and make sure that it's suitable for organic use in your own home, home yard. Okay. Sustainable ways of managing a garden are to use slow release fertilizers applied at far, far lower rates than weeds, weed and feeds or monthly liquid feeds. Um, so they, they give, you can use far less of them, the slow release fertilizers, and they give your plant more food for a longer period. Um, better yet, mulch gardens yearly with compost brought in or made in your own garden waste materials. Uh, I find that being able to mulch with my own compost is a very satisfying way to close my my waste stream. Verma composting, which is composting with, uh, with, with worms. And usually it's, it's a, there's a picture of it in the middle bottom here. Um, it's worm composting uh, and it's all, it's just composting food scraps in particular. Um, is a great way to compost your food scraps, especially if you cannot put food waste in a compost pile because of rodent problems. I, go, I have, this is actually my compost pile, my compost bins on the right-hand side, which are great and fabulous. I love them and they're very efficient and they work really well, but I can't put any food in them because we have a problem with rats. So it's better just to use a worm bin, which I can keep in a protected sheltered spot that's not gonna be accessible to animals. Um, to do all my food waste scraps. So it's also great to have a high powered fertilizer for house plants year round. So the, the worm tea that you can get, there's li the liquid will form a worm tea and then you'll also have worm castings and you can use those for your house plants very easily. It's very easy to use for that. Um, using manual or at the very least uh, power, at, at very least battery operated power tools greatly reduces air pollution and noise pollution, preventing water runoff into storm sewers by using a rain garden to redirect, redirect runoff or not washing your car in the driveway where the soap and oils can run down the drain are also sustainable practices to help water health. There's a rain garden off the side of our street that we've put in and that does help with runoff quite a bit. So after you stop using chemicals in the garden, you can start thinking about providing, providing food for the wildlife. This doesn't mean just hanging bird feeders on every vertical surface though. Wildlife really want to do their life's work of foraging and reproducing. So providing the plants that will feed birds, bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies will encourage a much larger selection of vi visitors. Like the saying goes, build it and they will come. So if you plant it, they will come. Trees such as um, the sour cherries, on the left-hand side, provide, provide nectar early in the year and berries later on. Even raccoons like to have their fill. Um, the plants that provide seeds, such as the poppies, also provide nectar for the bees early in the season. So a mix of native and ornamental varieties is a great way to design inviting spaces that may have a more refined appearance. The photo on the left has a mix of native dog roses, lavender, edible kiwi vines on the trellises, ornamental ground cover, creeping jenny, and some California poppies. And then the right-hand photo is a great example of a polyculture planting that will provide a wide, wide range of flowers that is 
similar to a smorgasbord for wildlife. There's a wide range of shapes and, and, si and different shapes and varieties of flowers in this picture here. So a variety of flower shapes will encourage many different pollinators, hummingbirds and butterflies prefer to have tubular shaped flowers. Bees really need to have flatter flowers in order to get at the nectar efficiently. Semi-double flowers are relatively easy for bees to use, but hybrid flowers that are fully double in form will be passed up every time. Um, hybrid tea rose is an example of a plant that usually is passed up for something that's much more si simple, like the dog, dog roses in the previous picture actually have a single petal shape to them. They're easy to access. And this is a video of my, in my kitchen garden, I have a small four by eight bed that is planted up with, with only um, pollinating plants that reseed themselves. In fact, this blue that's in flower right now is called a phacelia. Um, and it's, it's a huge attractor of bees. And I, I've sat and counted the different varieties of bees at one time in that bed, just from the facilia, and I've gotten over well over 15 at one, one day. So I can play a little bit of this. Yeah, in that bed, it really helps to have um, plants that reseed themselves continuously. So I don't have to actually add more plants every year. This, in fact, right now, this bed is getting ready to start um, sending up some flowers shoots pretty early too, when they self seed like that. So here's some more food sources that birds prefer. Rose hips up in the left-hand corner are very tasty for birds. They, very, they like them quite a bit. Um, cone flower seed heads, clematis, the, which is this picture down in the left-hand corner is a clematis that's gone to seed. Sometimes they you can use the down from the seed heads as to line their nests. So providing water. Source is essential to attracting wildlife. They need water not only to drink, but to bathe and, how, and for housing. Native bees lay their eggs in tubes or reeds and need mud to secure them. So shallow dishes with a little sand and a flat rock will benefit the bees and the butterflies. The butterflies like to have that flat rock to rest on. Larger in-ground pond um, that needs to have, if you have a larger in-ground pond, you need to have escape routes for smaller animals in case they fall in. So like this pond down here has a nice flat, gently sloping sides. So if something fell in or couldn't get out or needed to get out, they have easy access. Um, <clears throat> the naturalized planting also gives hiding spots and helps to blend it into the surrounding garden. A water source could be this whiskey barrel over on the right-hand side. Um, it's it has straight sides that are not very wildlife friendly, but they put a saucer, built up a saucer in the middle to give a flatter spot. And I'm assuming that there's rocks underneath it so that they would have a way of getting out if they fell in. Um, so still water will attract many more visitors than running fountains. It's definitely the preferred um, type of water for wildlife. Shelter is the last need that wildlife have. Wide open spaces either keep animals away or they will seek out more secluded edges to get away, to get from place to place. Animals are generally just trying to get safely from place to place when they live in the city with us. And our backyards become sort of a highway system for them so that they can avoid having to cross busy streets. Uh, right, the right hand picture is a small garden on a busy street here. The streets right behind the fencing. Um, there's a lot of cover for animals and even a small wood pile of old branches against the fence that will continue to provide shelter in the winter 
when all of the perennials have died back in that garden. When the garden on the left-hand side is just wide open and even along the fence line, oops, even along the fence line, there's really nowhere for animals. There's no cover for animals to get from place to place. They don't like to be out in the wide open as much as you might think. <clears throat> Shelter includes a place to raise young, hide from predators or rest in a shady spot in the summertime. Um, the Mason Bee House with tubes to lay their eggs for the following year, right up here in the left-hand corner. It's just a coffee can with a bunch of paper tubes for the bees. Um, do you do some research if you're interested in building bird houses? Every bird has its own requirements for what makes a good nesting box. Bad houses, that's just the picture down in the lower right-hand corner, are great. I grow hops for making beer and to help shade my greenhouse in the summertime, which is the picture up here in the right-hand corner. Um, I grow, yeah, we use it as supplemental shade in the summertime. It's at it's it's the south side of the greenhouse. And tree frogs can often be found hanging out in it, getting relief from the heat during the summertime. So a pile of brushes is the best thing that you can provide shelter, the best way to provide shelter. Animals can use it how they want to. Neighbors might not always like the look of the piles of branches though. So you might want to think about ways to make the pile more neat and, in, and more intentional looking. Um, picture in the middle is what's called a Benji's hedge, which is an old concept that's starting to get new life again. Um, you put in a row of, two rows, I'm sorry, two rows of posts and one on each side. And then you can just actually fill up that section with all of the brush that you've accumulated from pruning back your trees and your shrubs during the year. And it keeps it in a nice tidy pile, pile um, without having to go through the, the just, disturbance of having to, to chip it or, um, you know, put it in your green waste trash, anything like that. Um, so it has more of a fence-like fence, fence -like or hedge-like look to it, which might be more acceptable in a, in a neighborhood. So timing of seasonal chores needs to be thought about. Um, pruning back hedges in late spring or early summer coincides with nesting time some with most birds. Um, so either you want to make sure that there's no nests in the hedge before you prune, or you wait until the nests have been vacated later in the summer. So like towards the end of July, possibly. When you clean out a pond or cut back perennials, make sure to set the plant material to the side for a day or so. Um, this will allow whoever's living in it to get out and get to where it needs to be um, before get somewhere a ways away before the for chopping it up and putting it in your compost bin. So I know I put mine through a, uh, a a wood chipper a lot of times to get it very very small so it'll compost decompose very quickly. So if I was to do that with some of it, I make sure that all animals are out first. Um, when you clean, uh, use tools that rely on people power more than gas power. Leave plants that have seed heads alone in the fall. Leave them for the birds to eat. Um, honestly, they, they like to have the food all through the winter time and then you, you don't have to think so much about providing um, supplemental feeders for birds. Maybe you let the leaves be in the grass for the fall. A lot of insects like to um, use the fallen leaves as shelter or to lay their eggs over the winter. So, um, you know, maybe you don't want to leave the grass, the leaves on your grass, but at the very least you can rake them into your flower beds and use the, the leaves as mulch during the winter time. And it also provide a, a space for those insects to overwinter, overwinter themselves. So some people assume that a wildlife friendly garden needs to look at like the picture on the left. Uh, this is far from the case. The other two gardens are more wildlife friendly and that the selection of plants and how they are planted or used has been more carefully considered. So 
So the fastest way to keep your wildlife friendly garden appealing to neighbors is to make sure that the edges are neatly trimmed or there are obvious paths through the garden meadow areas. So the picture with the meadow makes it look much tidier and more intentional. And then the picture down the right hand corner, you know, just making sure the edges of the grass up along, if you have edgers along your, your garden beds, make sure they're nice and neatly trimmed. It, it, you know, that goes a long way to keeping things look more, looking more attractive to other people. And then last slide is, again, I can't say this too many times, you need to share your plants with the rest of the ecosystem. And it might not always be 100% perfect looking, but it'll be healthier and better off that way. So I have some websites that'll be very helpful too. Um, the National Wildlife Federation is a great website to go to. They have lists of native plants for your zip code. You put in your zip code and they can tell you exactly what plants are great for your area. Um, they have information about building butterfly habitats and other wildlife habitats. iNaturalist is um, a great one too. They actually have checklists of that have been compiled from residents all over the country. Um, there's one for Kitsap County of, of sightings of animals in their, in their yards and things like that. So there's a checklist of all the animals, of flora and fauna. And, I mean, all, and even aquatic animals in our county, it's pretty extensive and it's kind of a cool one to check on and see if you've seen any of those things in your backyard as well, or, you know, to keep, an eye, keep a lookout for. And then there's books for further information too. The book at the top, Deer Resistant Design, is a great book if you really need to get some, have some more ideas about living with deer instead of trying to exclude them. Um, I use I refer to that one quite a bit myself. So the last one is the Master Gardener website, and there's listings of dates and times of master gardener clinics in the county. We have a weekly Zoom call that you can call in on. You can go and have things ID'd or questions asked, anything like that. So that is it. Oh, thank you, Robin. And so um, just for reference for everybody, Robin's slides with the um, webs, webs pages and the books will be sent out to our attendees so that um, you will have those resources available if you wanna go back and look any of those up. Um, also, we have some time to answer questions now, so we will do that. And then again, here is the Master Gardener website if you wanna go visit that and um, find out other information about um, um, any other questions that you might have that we may not answer today. Um, so Robin, if you're ready, I've got a couple questions here in Q&A. Sure. Sure. Um, the first one is, my pest is the neighbor cat using an old cedar tree as a scratching pole. How can I deter the cat from scratching on the tree? Well, a lot of times just a physical kind of deterrent. So maybe wrapping some bird netting around where they like to scratch might make it, you know, make it annoying enough for them that they don't want to scratch on it anymore. Cause they obviously like the texture of the cedar tree. That's, you know, why they keep doing it. Um, I, I had trouble with cats in other gardens, um, especially new gardens that I've started where the plants have been filled in. Um, using it as litter boxes, which is happens quite a bit. And I took and stuck plastic forks up in the soil so that the tines were sticking up. And it was enough to deter them because they didn't like having to walk around them and things like that. So maybe on the tree, if you just took in and put some mesh around them, around it, maybe that might help. Thank Hopefully you. That's a good answer. <laughs> Um, do you have suggestions on how to deter mosquitoes from standing water in a garden? Are there native plants they don't like? Um, not so much the plants. It's really keeping the water fresh, I guess. Um, and then there are sort of non-chemical ways of doing that too. Um, 
in big ponds, if you have a big pond, bar using barley ba bales, a barley straw, tend to help clean the water and also kind of suck up the, the mosquito larva when they've been um, hatching. So that, that, that'll help quite a bit. There's things like mosquito dunks you can put in your water and there's, there's different, there's varying degrees of how toxic they are. Um, one way of maybe finding one would be to go on the, on the Omri website and see, you know, look up mosquito dunks or a brand name that you can, a brand of them that you find at the store, like at Lowe's or Home Depot and, and see if it's been listed with Omri. That might be a way of doing it. But otherwise, other than planting plants, there's really not any plants that they'll stay away from in water. That helps. Thank you. Um, so someone wrote that they live next to a stormwater runoff pond. Mm -hmm. um, how can I find more information about how to replace lawn with a rain garden? Uh, I did add two links. One is to the Kitsap Conservation District about their rain garden program, as well as another website that we have, Clean Water Kitsap. But I wanted to also run the question by you to see if you had any other ideas about um, replacing those, lawns the, with rain gardens. Those are great places to start. Um, and there's there are um, rain garden mentors that you can get a hold of, I think, through the Conservation District. And they go through um, training and they will help they can help you with any questions you have specific to rain gardens um, and I believe you can get that information from the conservation districts rain garden pages great. so that's, that's where I would start great they can actually uh, we'll, we'll physically come out to your house and help you yes they do on-site yep. um, yep. assistance yep um, do you know of a good place to get um, good clean fill dirt fill dirt yeah hmm well, I, I can think of, a, you know, like Morrison's in Port Orchard and, and there's a, um, Olympic Organics over on Wheaton Way in Bremerton here, but they, I, their dirt's really not fill dirt. It's more compost and um, garden blends and things. Not sure about the fill dirt. Okay. It depends on what you're going to be using it for, I think. So I need more, need more information. Um, I need about a little that. more information. That yeah, would be a I think good so. Question to reach out to the yeah. master gardeners about your specific. That's yeah, exactly. Um, I would like to plant for bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, but I get overwhelmed when looking at all the plant lists or even walking through the nursery. Do you have some favorite reliable choices um, that she can easily find that do here in a sunny part sun location? Yeah, there's, there's a lots of really great, um, reliable plants for bees and sun, um, you know, starting with, uh, maybe native plants and depending on how big a space you have one that I really, really like a lot is a Rosa rugosa or dog roses. Those really attract bees quite a bit. And they also will attract birds later when the hips form, um, any, any daisy like flowers, attract bees like crazy. Um, if you do any, if, if you have any vegetable, do any vegetable gardening, if you let, like, if you're growing kale or, um, you know, chard or any of the leafy greens, let them go to seed. The bees really like those a lot. So those are all some options, I guess. Great. Um, so this is a, a what ground covers do you recommend? Um, it doesn't really say anything about the site. Okay. Conditions. Yeah, I would need to know kind of more information if it's sunny or if it's shady or if it's an under trees. Um, there's there's so many different kinds of ground covers that um, if you want something that's going to be more of a dense mat or something that's going to have flowers. There's you know there's evergreen ones and there's there's deciduous, more shrubby crown covers. One that I've been planting lately, um, it's a, a native, is a native dogwood ground cover. It's very, it's very cute and it has the little dogwood flowers just like on the trees, but it's a very tight growing um, shrub that only gets to be about two or three inches tall. Great. So. 
Um, what is the best replacement for weed and feed for lawn weeds? And what is the best way to get rid of, get the rid of moss in the lawn? Oh my goodness. Two very big questions. <laughs> big questions. Big questions. Yes. Um, so the moss, first of all, that usually tends to, moss tends to grow because your soil is more acidic generally. Um, in the area, very the drainage may be pretty poor in the winter time. Um, sometimes, you know, putting lime down in the spring and in the fall again will help change the uh, pH of your soil a little bit. That's not exactly a complete solution either. Um, you can't put it down in really large uh, quantities because it it's not usually very fast acting. It takes time to break down and to really get in the soil. Um, but that might be one way to maybe start to take care of the moss problem. Um, scratching it out and then reseeding is a good solution. But if it's your soil, if it's definitely because your soil is got too low of pH, then that's not, it's just going to turn back into moss again. Um, and the other question was, I'm sorry, what was the other question? Um, oh, about an alternative for weed and feed. That's a tough one. There's not really anything for weeds that's going to be the alternative. So it's it's much better just to use um, even a very thin layer of, of organic compost spread across your lawn and and not and it like watered in it really is a good great way to keep it fed. Um, the weeds, other than, you know, physically taking them out is tough. It's, it's not fun, but it, it, you might have to do that. Or, you know, maybe if you want to overseed with things like clover and mix it up a little bit so that there's not, you don't really notice this, the weeds as much. I mean that dandelions are a great food source for honeybees and other bees. They really like it a lot. And I, I know I let mine, mine flower and bloom in the, in the grass. Um, I just make sure I mow it before it starts to go to seed. And that helps cut down on things. Using a mulching blade on your mower too really helps um, mulch. So it, it cuts the, the uh, grass leaf very tiny and redeposits it back into your soil. And that'll break down almost like um, compost in place. And that helps feed this, the lawn too. Um, you can have a very lush lawn by just by using your mulching blade on your lawnmower. But if you wanted to have maybe, con you could contact uh, Master Gardeners too. And like maybe on the Zoom call would be a good one to get more information on that. Great. Um, where can I shop for manual gardening tools and what are examples of manual gardening tools? Oh, okay. Well, so some examples, um, I had a picture of a scythe, which seems really silly, but it's really fun to use. And I have a meadow area that I use it in the fall to just whack everything down. And, um, those other manual tools would be things like, you know, using a handsaw instead of using chainsaws. Um, it, within reason, if you have something that's really big, it doesn't make any sense to use a handsaw. You're going to want to use a chainsaw, but there are battery powder powered chainsaws that are just as um, forceful as a gas powered one. Um, push mower that, it, that, with, that has the rotating blades on it. That's a great um, uh, solution for getting rid of your gas powered mower. Um, the only problem with the with the push mower, like uh, sometimes if you let your lawn get a little bit too long, it won't cut as well as you might want to. So, um, you know, the battery powered lawn mowers are solution to. They really do a great job, and they take very little electricity to power up the batteries, and they are so much quieter for the neighbors. Don't have to listen to. Um, and you know, if you're cutting your hedge instead of using a light, big long hedge trimmer with a big long blade on it, you know, just go back to using the the um, hand pruners with the they have long handles on them. And they give you a good workout at the same time. <laughs> Great. 
Do you know of any compost tea companies in the Port Orchard area? Compost tea? No, I do not actually. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I don't know any of that. I mean, I, you know, you can, you can buy organic compost, like I said, places like um, Morrison Gravel, they have it. Um, West Sound Landscaping, I believe has some, but the tea, I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. You may right. check the local nurseries and see if they yeah. have a lot of our local nurseries series carry some of the, maybe some of those possibly. types of items. Possibly. I mean, yeah, yeah possibly. The liquid um, fish emulsion or seaweed emulsion is a great liquid feed. If you, if you're just looking for something that's going to be a liquid feed for like, if you have plants and pots and things like that, um, that's just as, as good as using a compost tea. Um, no. And I think you sort of addressed this question of keeping cats out of vegetable beds. You sort of mm. gave some good ideas with your, with the cedar tree. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, I, I stuck forks and plastic forks in the ground and that worked pretty quickly. And once they stopped coming to the garden, I pulled them out. And then by then the plants were grown over. Um, I have a friend that she has screens that um, are made to the size of her raised beds and they have hardware cloth and they, she can put them over the beds so that the cats can't dig in them while the seeds are germinating. Um, just putting a barrier is usually the thing that you need to do because they, they, they want to scratch in the, in the fluffy soil. They don't like to have to scratch on metal and things like that. Okay. And then uh, we just had a clarification to the um, fill dirt question is for raised mm -hmm. beds. People for raised beds? For raised beds. Okay. Well, depending on how tall your raised bed is, um, you could just, you know, I, I have single layer beds that are 10 inches high. And I just went ahead and got a mix of garden compost. So it's like a five-way mix. It has a three-way mix maybe. Um, and Olympic Organics is great for that. They're, they're really good. They're on Wheaton Way. There's also, uh, they also have one, uh, one of their, their outlets is in Kingston, I believe. I'd have to double check that though. Um, so if you just get a, a garden mix, that's like three ways. So it's going to be topsoil compost um, and some sand sometimes. That's going to be the more, more economical route to fill up a raised bed. And then every year I would give a, a layer of good organic compost over the top to help feed that soil and really bulk, keep it bulked up um, so that eventually it's going to be pretty moisture retentive for you. So hopefully that helps. Great. Thank you. If you want to move it to the last slide, that's it for questions. Sure. And we will go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Um, so I uh, just want to let everybody know that when you leave, there will be um, a survey that pops up on your screen. Uh, we do hope that you will just take a few minutes, it's very brief, to just to provide us with uh, your feedback. Um, as I mentioned, I will be following up in the next couple of days with um, a recording of this presentation and the slides. Um, but also on that survey, if you are wanting sort of some personalized feedback from a master gardener, you can add your email address and a master gardener will follow up with you in a couple months um, just to check in and see how things are going and see if you have any specific questions. Um, we also hope that maybe you have been inspired today to consider uh, more organic or natural ways of, um, of managing your garden care. And so we do have a coupon. Um, you, this QR code will take you to that coupon or you can, um, I'll also be emailing it, including the, in the email. It's for 25% off for um, a bag of natural lawn fertilizer. And we've partnered with five retailers throughout the um, area to, um, to do that. So otherwise we um, appreciate you being here. And Robin, thank you so much for your help today. And I hope you all have a great weekend. So thank you so much. Bye.